So how do I understand and frame a clinical question? And what is the PICO framework? In this tutorial, you are going to learn both. Welcome. This is Eric McCoy, aka McCoy, aka EMAC, from the University of California, Irvine Department of Emergency Medicine. And in this tutorial, we're going to talk about understanding and framing clinical questions using the PICO framework. By the time we're done with our educational activity, you are going to be able to describe the difference between background and foreground questions. You're going to be able to identify the components of a clinical research question using the PICO framework. And last but not least, you're going to be able to list the five types of foreground clinical questions. Background versus foreground questions. For background questions, I want you to imagine the newly minted medical student who is just fresh out of undergrad and ready to get face in with regards to learning everything they need to know about medicine. Now, these medical students may have little knowledge base and skill set on managing patients in the clinical setting. So what type of questions do you think these medical students would have? With regard to background questions, these questions address the general clinical questions regarding a topic or a condition. So the medical student, if they had a patient on the ward and they were following that had an acute myocardial infarction, or more specifically, an ST segment myocardial infarction, what questions would they have? They'd have questions such as, well, what is a myocardial infarction? What causes it? How do these patients present to the emergency department or to the clinic or to the hospital? How do I diagnose this condition? And last but not least, what treatment options are available? And so these background questions help to build the fund of knowledge in the learner who knows little about managing these types of patients in the clinical setting. And where do these medical students get this type of information? They typically get it from textbooks, whether online or in the library, or things such as narrative reviews. Because again, these background questions address general clinical questions regarding a topic or a specific medical condition, building the knowledge base with regards to learning the fundamentals of how this clinical condition presents, how you diagnose it, and even how you treat it. Now, I want you to contrast that with the experienced clinician. The experienced clinician has not only the knowledge base, the skill set, but they also have some experience on managing these patients in the clinical setting. And their questions may be a little bit different than the background question the new and novice medical student may ask. Now, these are foreground questions. So the experienced clinicians typically ask foreground questions. And these foreground questions answer specific clinical questions for specific patients and populations. So it's more specific to a patient or population, and it's a specific question. So what are some questions the experienced clinician may ask in the same environment? Well, does drug A decrease in mortality compared to drug B? Or how about what is the diagnostic accuracy of a particular EKG finding for acute myocardial infarction? Or how about on treatments? Is percutaneous coronary intervention with stenting superior to cabbage or coronary artery bypass grafting for decreasing mortality in patients suffering an ST segment myocardial infarction? Now, if you notice, these questions pertain to a specific patient or a specific patient population. And they take a little bit more than just knowing the background, knowing just the general fundamentals of a condition. It asks something specific, something that's going to assist the clinician in either diagnosing the patient, either giving the patient a specific therapy, or even helping patients with their prognosis, their, their, the future course of events they can anticipate to happen. And where do we find foreground questions? Some examples on where can the clinicians can find foreground questions is original clinical research, or even secondary sources where individuals or groups analyze primary medical literature. We can see synopsis or synthesis, which is essentially summarizing studies or synthesizing all the available evidence that answered a specific focused clinical question. These things are called systematic reviews, which we'll get into during another tutorial, or even guidelines or summaries. And so, this is where the experienced clinician looks for their foreground questions because they have specific questions for a specific medical condition for specific patients and or populations.
And so when we're talking about clinical questions in this tutorial, we're talking about foreground questions, not necessarily the background questions. Because as you learn about certain medical conditions as a medical student or any type of student in the game or, or, or the practice of medicine, you start off building your fund of knowledge with the background questions and have a little bit of foreground questions. But then as you gain experience, as you have knowledge, as you build your skills, the background questions you have seem to shrink, and at the same time, the foreground questions seem to enlarge. Components of a clinical question. And so dissecting the question into its component parts to facilitate finding the best evidence is a fundamental skill for anybody interested in becoming a well-informed consumer of the medical literature. Now, the general structure of any clinical question typically consists of a few things. Patients, exposures, and outcomes. Specifically, the PICO framework is the most widely used for both searching the medical literature for an answer to a specific clinical question and crafting a clinical question for medical research. So whether you're a well-informed consumer of the medical literature or you are a researcher, it's vitally important that you know the components of a legitimate and relevant clinical question. So let's talk about the PICO framework for clinical questions. And what is PICO? PICO is an acronym. P stands for patients or populations. In particular, a specific population or patients with specific characteristics. For instance, you may be interested in patients or populations of adults age 18 to 65 who have high blood pressure, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and suffer an acute myocardial infarction presenting to the emergency department within 10 hours of symptom onset. Now that's pretty specific. Now the more specific your population is, the more useful the data will be with regards to the studies that address that specific clinical condition in that specific population. Now if you had a very broad population such as adults presenting with pain, well, that wouldn't be specific enough and the literature really wouldn't help you. So we're talking about specific patients and our specific populations. P, patients or populations. I stands for interventions or exposures. In our acute myocardial infarction example, the intervention A could have been percutaneous coronary intervention with stenting and or exposure. So an exposure is something you're gonna see in the public health literature that's not necessarily a quote unquote intervention. For instance, we may be interested in harm from something, like harm from an exposure. For instance, if we're interested in, uh, if we believe that people living next to a nuclear power plant may have higher rates of thyroid cancer, we wouldn't necessarily call that an intervention, it's an exposure. But we'd be interested in rates of thyroid cancer in those exposed, those who live near a nuclear power plant, compared to those who are not exposed, those who live a certain distance away from a nuclear power plant. So I is for interventions or exposures if we're thinking about harms. So interventions and exposures, therapy or harms. C stands for a comparator. So we're comparing an intervention or an exposure to what? It could be placebo, which is basically a sugar pill or nothing that much at all, or it can be an active comparison. In this case, drug A versus drug B. In this case, this is an active control. So in our case of the acute myocardial infarction, we're looking at the effect of A, percutaneous coronary intervention with stenting versus B, coronary artery bypass grafting. So we're comparing our intervention to what? And last but not least, outcomes. In particular, we wanna focus on patient important outcomes. And these are the outcomes we're looking at to compare our two groups, our intervention group versus control group, or our exposed group versus non-exposed group. Our outcomes could be anything from morbidity all the way until mortality. And so those researchers designing the research determine what outcomes they're looking at, and those well-informed consumers of the medical literature determine what type of outcomes they want to search for. So now with this PICO framework in mind, patients, interventions, comparator, and outcomes, let's take a look at a few examples. In this New England Journal of Medicine article, thrombectomy six to 24 hours after stroke with a mismatch between deficit and infarct. And so the background for this is that the effective endovascular thrombectomy that's performed more than six hours after the onset of ischemic stroke is uncertain. And so for those who us, of us who are unfamiliar with 
what ischemic stroke is and what thrombectomy is, is an ischemic stroke is essentially a stroke for the most part where a blood clot goes up to one of the vessels in the brain and clogs off that artery. And if you have a clogging of the artery, you don't have any blood flow beyond that artery, you get ischemic tissue or injured tissue or tissue that dies or infarcted tissue. Now there are certain therapies such as TPA, which is a drug uh, that essentially blows up the clot that you um, uh, after you push the drug, but there are other therapies like going in and retrieving this clot, physically retrieving the clot. And in this case, that's thrombectomy. And so little is known about uh, the effect of thrombectomy after six hours after the onset of these ischemic stroke symptoms. Now, we do know that the longer it takes you to get care after the onset of your ischemic stroke, the worse off you are from a functional neurological standpoint. And so, the longer you go out from your initial symptoms, the worse your symptoms are, but there are new therapies that can help patients with regards to minimizing the negative consequences of their stroke. And one of these therapies is thrombectomy, going inside uh, through the blood vessels and removing the clot out. And so, in this case, patients with a clinical deficit that is disproportionate proportionally severe relative to the infarct size seen on their brain imaging, these patients may benefit. And let's take a look at the methods in this, uh, in this study. And so remember, patients, interventions, comparison, and outcome. So patients, or who are the patients that they studied in this uh, clinical trial? Well, they enrolled patients with an inclusion of either the internal carotid artery or the proximal middle cerebral artery who had last been known to be well six to 24 hours prior, who had a mismatch between their clinical signs and symptoms, and the infarct volume that was seen on their brain imaging. So this is a very specific set of patients, a, an ischemic stroke set of patients with specific findings on their brain imaging. So this is the patients in our PICO mnemonic. How about the intervention? In this case, the intervention was thrombectomy plus standard care. And remember, thrombectomy was going inside the vessel and removing this blood clot from this occluded vessel, comparison, standard care alone, or the control group, and O is for outcome. What was the outcome? So the co-primary endpoints or outcomes were essentially disability and functional independence at 90 days. In this particular study, they used something called the utility weighted modified Rankin scale, as well as the modified Rankin scale, which for our intensive purposes measures disability all the way from no symptoms at all, all the way until death. And this is one of the most widely used outcome measurement scales in the neurological literature with specific regard to disability and functional independence or functional neurological outcome. So in this case, we have identified the patients, intervention, comparison, and outcome. And this happens to be a therapy trial. Let's take a look at one more example. Another New England Journal article, a randomized trial of epinephrine in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And the background to this study is that with regards to ACLS or advanced cardiac life support, epinephrine is one of the drugs that have met uh, the criteria to be included in our guidelines, which means that guidelines are kind of really high in the evidence-based pyramid with regards to the types of data, information, and literature we're looking for to help guide our clinical practice. However, there's been some concern and consternation on whether or not uh, it's beneficial for patients. One thing that makes it difficult for drugs that make it the guidelines, and one thing that makes it difficult for researchers, is to really test the safety and efficacy of these drugs for a particular condition. In this case, the condition is out of hospital cardiac arrest or somebody needing CPR. And if a drug makes it to the guideline level, it's dang near impossible if not unethical for researchers to randomize patients to either A, get a medication that's on our guidelines, or B, receive nothing at all. And so the concern about the use of epinephrine as a treatment for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest led the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation to call for a placebo-controlled trial to determine whether the use of epinephrine is safe and effective in such patients. So let's take a look at the methods in this study. How about the patients? The patients in this study were patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the United Kingdom. Again, epinephrine is on the guidelines in the continental United States for ACLS or advanced cardiac life support, so it would be relatively difficult, if not unethical, for researchers to randomize a patient to get nothing compared to a drug that's on the guideline, which is why these patients were in the United Kingdom. Intervention, in this case, parenteral epinephrine. 
about the comparison or the comparator, saline placebo, and the outcome. In this case, the primary outcome was a rate of 30-day survival, but they also looked at the secondary outcome of survival until hospital discharge with favorable neurologic outcome, as indicated by a score of three or less on the modified Rankin scale. And again, this modified Rankin scale is an outcome measurement tool that has been validated and is widely used in the medical literature with regards to looking at uh, the functional neurological status, disability, uh, and disability of patients, which, which ranges from no symptoms, zero, all the way until death or six. the five types of foreground clinical questions. And so you're gonna have so many different types of questions and it's good for you to categorize the type of clinical question you have because later on that's gonna allow you to search for the appropriate study design that allows you to answer this clinical question. So let's get into these five types of foreground clinical questions now. Questions on therapy. And so questions on therapy help you determine the effect of an intervention on patient important outcomes. Drug A versus drug B. Is therapy A better than therapy B? But it can also be things such as educational interventions. So for therapy studies, we're looking at the effect of a specific therapy, a specific intervention, a specific procedure on patient important outcomes. Now don't get me wrong, you're going to come across a lot of literature that has outcomes that aren't necessarily too patient important, I want you to focus on though patient important outcomes. The difference between life and death or the difference between being able to take care of yourself or walk or not being able to take care of yourself and walk is more important to patients than a change in their serum creatinine level, which is a blood test you can send to see how a patient's kidneys are functioning. And so there are patient important outcomes and there's disease specific outcomes. In another tutorial, we'll talk about surrogate endpoints, but for our purposes right now, I want you to focus on patient important outcomes. So therapy questions. How about questions on harm? And so questions on harm uh, help you ascertain the effects of potentially harmful agents, including therapies, on patient important outcomes. And in these in these types of questions and in these types of studies, you may be interested in seeing certain consequences of being exposed to something that may be harmful. For instance, patients who live next to nuclear power plants may have, have higher rates of cancer, or patients who may consume certain types of medication may have certain types of side effects such as arrhythmias or kidney failures. And so in these cases, we wouldn't necessarily call them interventions, we call them exposures because we want to look to see if a certain exposure or associated with certain outcomes. For instance, smoking. Before we know, before we knew smoking was bad for you, it causes heart disease, lung disease, and cancer. Before we knew that, we didn't know that. So in this case, studies way back in the day looked at the exposure of smoking compared to non-smoking on harmful outcomes such as cardiovascular disease, death, or lung cancer. How about questions that pertain to differential diagnosis? You may have a patient that comes with a certain constellation of signs and symptoms. You may get something on your history, your physical exam, even your laboratories, and you ask the question, well, with these patients with these characteristics, what are the different types of diagnoses that are possible, and what's the likelihood of these different options that I'm thinking about? And so for differential diagnosis, basically asking patients with a particular clinical presentation, it helps you establish the frequency of the underlying disorders. How about diagnosis? And in particular, diagnostic test or diagnostic test accuracy. And so in this case, it helps you establish the power of a test to differentiate between those patients with and without a target condition or disease. And so in these questions, you're really thinking about what is the, the accuracy of this specific diagnostic test for identifying patients who have this disease versus those patients who do not have the disease. For a diagnostic test, the variables we're going to be thinking about are patient, exposure in this case is the test, and the outcome is the criterion standard or the best thing you have to get in the ultimate quote unquote gold standard diagnoses. And last but not least, prognosis or estimating the, estimating the patient's future course. There is a three element research question with regards to um, prognosis, which you take into consideration the patient, the exposure is time, and you're looking at an, out, at an outcome. For instance, if you're looking at um, the oncology literature, in patients with a certain type of cancer who get a specific type of treatment, well, 
How long can they expect to survive? In this case, the exposure is simply time. Um, however, you can also have a four element research question where you have your patients. Exposure could be a patient related factor, such as age, gender, or co comorbid dis um, conditions. And the comparator could be uh, not having com comorbid conditions, or being much younger, or being a different sex. And then the outcomes could be whatever you're looking for in the medical literature, or whatever the researcher decided to measure as their outcome. And so in summary, we talked about the difference between background and foreground questions, those questions that looks at the basic fundamental knowledge about a medical condition, and those questions that help you in the clinical setting with regards to your patients. We identified the components of a clinical research question using the PICO framework, patients, intervention, comparison, and outcome. And last but not least, we talked about the five types of foreground clinical questions, the differential diagnosis, diagnosis, therapy, harm, and prognosis. And in a future tutorial or a different tutorial, this is going to help you identify the type of study design that answers your research question. So that's the next step after understanding what type of research question you have is identifying the type of study design that answers your research question. And for this, see our online tutorials on research methods and study designs. Once again, this is Eric McCoy, a.k.a. McCoy, a.k.a. EMAC, from the University of California, Irvine Department of Emergency Medicine, signing out, work smart, not hard.